Welcome to SEC Football Live here from 440 Sports. My name is Braden Gall. You can follow me on Twitter.com at Braden Gall. Our guest today on the show is going to be Josh McQuiston of Soonerscoop.com. He's been covering Oklahoma for a very long time, and I have also known him for a very, very long time. We're going to get into a lot of stuff about the Sooners as they transition into the SEC. If you, of course, are new to SEC Football Live and you're an Oklahoma fan, please Give us a little subscription button there. You can also find the show via podcast everywhere you get your podcast, SEC Football Live. We are live every Tuesday at 1 o'clock Eastern time, noon Central Standard, God's time. Uh, so, Josh, we're going to talk with Josh McQuiston about Oklahoma, the state of the program. How has it evolved from when Bob Stoops took over and won a national championship game, giving up two points, to through the Lincoln-Riley era and now into Brent Venables? And how prepared is this program for life in the SEC from an infrastructure standpoint, NIL, recruiting, the front seven, defense. We're going to talk about Jackson Arnold, very high praise for the young quarterback, the schedule, what are fans looking forward to? And yes, of course, I had to ask him about Oklahoma State. So I'm fascinated with Oklahoma and the narrative around this program. For those that don't know, of course, Oklahoma was the dominant program in the Big 12 for a very, very long time. That narrative has kind of shifted in the last few years with Texas getting into the playoff in 2023, but I don't think fans in the SEC need to forget about the fact that Oklahoma was the dog in the Big 12 for 20 years. So I don't think it'll take them long to adapt, but I am fascinated with where they're at as a program, where the coaching staff is at as a as a, uh, as a as a team, and of course where the roster is as they enter what is going to be a very difficult schedule in 2024. So enough of me. Give us a subscription, of course, at 440 Sports. Uh, here was my conversation with the great Josh McQuiston of Soonerscoop.com. We welcome to the show Josh McQuiston of Soonerscoop.com. Josh, always a pleasure to see you. Thank you so much for giving us a few minutes of your time, sir. How are you? I'm good, Braden. Every time I'm on with you, man, I, I remember us being much younger guys. I don't know what happened to those days, but we have known each other a long time. Yeah, there's but our beards are slightly different colors uh, mm -hmm. this at this point than when we got started uh, almost 20 years ago, in fact. And so much has changed, and that's kind of what we're going to talk about today. I certainly want to look at sort of the prospects for Oklahoma in 2024. Very difficult schedule, new conference, new playoff structure, new quarterback, new coordinator, all kinds of new stuff. But I also want to take a look at the program. And when you and I first got started, uh, or at least when I got started and, and I met you, uh, back in like 2005, six and seven, Oklahoma was a very different program. It was sort of the heyday of the Bob Stoops. And I always kind of say, I always kind of separate them into like Bob Stoops part one. And then there's like Bob Stoops part two, which sort of like bleeds into Lincoln Riley. And I just want to get your thoughts on sort of the evolution from the, the, the team that was built similarly, actually to, to Michigan that won a national championship with defense and, and the way Bob Stoops originally built this program, then it sort of evolves in the early 2010s it, Lincoln Riley takes over it becomes this offensive juggernaut always very good on offense but even more so in those years and now of course we'll get to Brent Venables but how different is this program from those days 04 05 06 to where we're at today I think under Venables you're seeing some some bridge being built between those teams because you know like you said it became so offensively centric um, from really 2010, kind of mid Landry Jones era to, you know, the arrival of Brent Venables. And even this year defensively was nowhere near what, you know, those early Bob Stoops teams were, you know, that, that held Florida state to two points in a national title game, you know, that, that kind of stuff. I, I think if I told a kid that today, they were like, wait, wait, Oklahoma did what? Like that, I, I don't think they would even comprehend that reality. I, I think some of that is we know college football just doesn't exist like that anymore. But, um, you know, it, it is, there's no question that they are rebuilding the defense that, you know, getting guys like Billy Bowman and Danny Stutzman to return is not only a sign of Oklahoma doing better with development and evaluation, but also that defense feeling like, hey, this could be pretty good next year. You know, they, they feel like there's a reason to believe rather than like, well, you know, we've got an NF, we've got some NFL draft stock and we're going to go while we can, which is kind of what happened for a lot of years. There guys like Trey Brown leaving early to go be like a fifth round pick, um, you know, and, and he's really done well for the Seattle Seahawks. But, you know, it was one of those deals where you thought, well, he could have come back for a year and really helped his stock. But I, I think Venables is starting to give the, the defensive guys a little hope that there is 
more to Oklahoma's program than just scoring points. Is it fair as an outsider to sort of view like that Gerald McCoy era, which would have been like the 08 team that mm -hmm. lost in the championship game, but still gave Florida a pretty good run, relatively speaking, considering how good those Florida teams were. That like that was sort of the end point of the elite five star defensive lines that Oklahoma had built their program on. And then like after that, that the the, the complaint or the criticism of Oklahoma was just they don't have the horses in the front seven the way the Alabamas or the Clemsons or even the Ohio States were that went on to win national championships. Certainly with a, a defensive minded coach, that is, as you've alluded to, the goal is to sort of shift that and you're going to have to in the SEC. Is that a fair sort of view of it all? Is like that was kind of a line of demarcation that those that team was maybe the last team that had that ability? I think that's really fair to say. Uh, you know, Gerald is, uh, you know, for a program with Oklahoma's history and tradition and and you know, I know people when they hear that, especially younger people will say, oh, yeah, all the quarterbacks and receivers, you can go back. Oklahoma, you know, has won so many national awards, defensive line, linebackers, you know, you, you go down the list and people, it's just, it's a program that's become synonymous with offensive football. And, um, you know, I, what is interesting, you know, you talked in the lead in kind of about Oklahoma being, all, you know, under Bob Stoops, almost two different eras there was two I, I, you could almost argue there were three where they were really that premier program from about 2000 to 2008 which in that run I would say probably only USC could lay claim to consistently being a better program in that era uh and then kind of 09 to like 13 it was very middling you know kind of Oklahoma was a 8 to 12 team in the country which is really good by most standards but for Oklahoma that's just not where they wanted to be and then, you know, you had Oklahoma make the change from Josh Heupel to Lincoln Riley, and that really kind of breathed some new life into Oklahoma's program. And, I, you know, I think a lot of people at the time put a lot of that on Heupel. I think we've pretty clearly seen that's not fair. Um, but Lincoln Riley did give Oklahoma something they needed, kind of a shot in the arm. But it just became this – it went from the early years where there was still some remnant of the Bob Stoops era – to when it just became solely Lincoln Riley's program, that it was just so offensively driven. There was nothing there on the defensive side of the ball, and there didn't seem to be a lot of concern over what it would become. So to me, there was almost three eras of Bob Stoops, but I, I do. I, I think that is where you're seeing, like I said earlier, Brent Venables bridge that gap a lot where they are starting to land those elite defensive players. You know, they. I, I think I had a stat earlier this year where over the last couple of classes, they've landed – I believe four top 100 defensive linemen, which was equal to like the previous 12 classes or something, something crazy like that. So, I mean, it, there is a clear focus and a success rate, you know, in recruiting uh, the defensive line since Brent Venables returned. So that leads us sort of like structurally uh, as a program. We, we know that Jeff Levy was instrumental in sort of helping with the NIL stuff um, and sort of getting that off the ground. Certainly a lot of other people as well. He, of course, is gone. Seth Luttrell is in to call plays. We'll get to the roster here in a second. But I just think I want I'm curious stru structurally is everything in place that Oklahoma would need to because, again, the SEC is just a different monster from a recruiting standpoint. It is deep, deep, deep shark infested waters and the NILs and the collectives and even the boosters still paying under the table still happens. I'm, I, I hate to break it to folks. Um <laughs> Next thing you'll know, you tell me college kids drink underage as well, uh, Josh. But what I think is interesting is like you have to have this infrastructure now. It's not just about the five star facility. And and I was actually in I was actually uh, interviewing uh, Lincoln Riley and Baker Mayfield in Norman before Lincoln Riley became the head coach. And, and it was like the year before. And like they were doing so much work on everything at that time. And everything like you still need that stuff, but it's not as important as like sort of the, the mechanics of the infrastructure about players on the back end, where is Oklahoma? We have a good feeling that Texas has built this up pretty well, right? Like we have a pretty good idea that they're, they're getting that in line heading into the sec. Where's Oklahoma at in, in all of this? Uh, that's to me, one of the interesting questions that Oklahoma is going to have to answer, because I do think there has been a realization um, from Brent Venables to, you know, athletic director, Joe Castiglione, you know, you go down the list, where Oklahoma has taken some stock and said, 
we're not going to win recruiting battles, which we all know is the whole point of all of this. I mean, that, that that's, you know, Nick Saban's an incredible coach. Nick Saban's nothing without, you know, the laundry list of first round picks that he has run out on that field for Alabama. Like that's, that's just the reality. This is a, um, it's a talent driven sport and, you know, I guess any sport is, but to, to get to what I'm saying, I think Oklahoma kind of took stock last year. They um, they made some changes within kind of Brent Venable's support staff that had been very focused on fundraising with um, uh, an eye towards facilities and, re, you know, kind of continuing to build this whole new football facility that was going to be something like $220 million. I mean, it was going to be a massive, massive um, upgrade to just the football facility itself. But I, I think they just kind of said, we could do all this or we could put more focus on NIL. We can, you know, start having our our donors start thinking in that direction and kind of put that on the front burner. And I think that's what you've seen happen. And so Oklahoma has become much more competitive in the NIL market over the last couple of years than they really were early, you know, the, those first, you know, the infancy of NIL, I guess you'd say. So um, at the same time, there's still a lot of growth needed. Uh, I think... More than anything, I think Oklahoma has got to get it all working in concert. Like, I, I think you have different ideas of what that means from administration, from coaches, from the donors themselves. So Oklahoma has got to kind of iron that out. I And I don't think it's a thing. I don't think it's any huge issue. You know, obviously, Brent Venables is very well liked around Norman, around Oklahoma. The donors like him. They respond to him. Uh, Joe Casiglione is as respected and organized an athletic director as there is in the country. And so I, I think it happens. It's just kind of one of those deals where Oklahoma has worked so hard to shake some of those things of the past that predated Bob Stoops, the, you know, the NCAA sanctions and some of those things that really littered the Barry Switzer era and even, you know, beyond uh, that timeline that I think, there's some overcorrection where Oklahoma sometimes ties their hands behind their own back for no apparent reason. Like uh, a perfect example, Braden would be, um, and it's one I bring up a lot just because it's so telling to me, Oklahoma to this day will not allow a media member to take a picture of a recruit who is on campus for an, a visit at campus. Now fans, any fan in the stands can take a picture with the kid. <laughs> but we as a media member can't look and snap a picture of the kid standing on the sidelines without hearing from OU's compliance department. So, and again, that's a minimal thing that has nothing really to do. I'm just trying to say there are times when Oklahoma almost goes out of their way to make life hard on themselves. And I think you've got to find some streamlining to, to uh, again, Oklahoma's going to the SEC. This isn't, this isn't choir anymore. Like they're, they're going to have yeah. to be willing to, to know where they need to bend and flex. Well, what's fascinating about the national championship, and I've got a philosophical question about the direction of the sport. I'll ask you here in a second, but it's funny. Like, like I, I think when you say that, I think of, man, wouldn't it be good free earned media, as we say in the business, for the media to be blathering on about how many elite four and five star players are at this game, like, and with pictures of them for the fans mm -hmm. and for other teams and other recruits to see. It's almost as if that would be a positive for the university. Um, but, uh, but it makes me think of the Big Ten before Urban Meyer because Urban Meyer got to Ohio State and, like, shook the whole thing up. Like, he he was like, no, well, there's no gentleman's rules in recruiting. We're going to take your commitments right before signing day. And Harbaugh's kind of done the same thing. It's like, no, if we want to win a national championship, we got to play by the big boy rules, which is a, a lot of times the SEC setting the bar – at, at, at whatever ethical line you want to <laughs> whatever whatever line you want to draw mm. on the sand on whatever incident but I think that's what Michigan has done and I think you've seen the results Ohio State and Michigan both have a championship in the last 10 years uh, Texas and Oklahoma it feels like they are getting the message that that is what you have to kind of do if you're going to play ball in the SEC absolutely I mean and, and that is you know one of the things that I think at Texas, Sark has done such a nice job of because we, you know, Braden, you've covered it a long time from a national perspective. And obviously being around Oklahoma's program, you hear a lot of talk. And obviously I talk to all the various Texas reporters and sites and, you know, go on their shows and that kind of stuff. And I I think they realize the same, the same thing we all knew for so long. There was too many cooks in the kitchen. Like at some yeah. point yeah. 
it's not Charlie Strong can't coach. It's not Tom Herman can't coach. Like you're letting too many people have a say in how this thing is run. And I think that's a large credit to Chris Del Conte. I think he's done a great job making sure that Steve Sarkeesian just gets to be a football coach and do the things that a head coach is supposed to do. And I think that helps Texas a ton. Oklahoma, that's never really been their problem. Yeah, I, I think yeah. Oklahoma has to – I mean, because in, in Oklahoma, I mean, it, it, it's the show in town. I mean, the Thunder are very popular, and obviously Oklahoma State is, is right up the road. But, you know, o Oklahoma is – not quite Nebraska, but it's very much the same in that that's what people in the state want to talk about. You know, it's there's no off season at Soonerscoop.com because <laughs> everybody's already talking about the 2024 depth chart. Yeah. I'm answering questions yeah. about what the tight end room is going to look like as we speak. So, <laughs> you know, that that I mean, that there's no breaks on that kind of thing. So, and it's it's what I love about the sport. I mean, it's why I grew up loving it. Um, but yeah, th there is no question that Oklahoma is going to have to take a look in the mirror and say. These are the things that we're doing that help us. And these are the things that we're doing that hurt us. And I, I think, uh, especially within the NIL space, it's going to be very interesting to see how they move forward without Jeff Levy, because Jeff Levy was a very key piece of that, of that puzzle. He had a lot of good relationships, with the NIL folks. And I think Oklahoma, and again, I, I will say some of the things I've heard behind the scenes, they are Oklahoma's aware of it. They, they know they've got to figure that out and make sure everybody knows who they need to make a call to when the when the time is right in the transfer portal or whatever however you want to term yep. that um but roster knows, manage yeah, it <laughs> absolutely and, and and so yeah so again lo very long answer as we all know i'm yeah. very good at those but um yeah what? I, I i do they the biggest thing and i, I say it all the time to ou fans and i and sometimes i have to be a little obscure about it because you can't just say this is the problem but it's don't make rules to make life harder for yourself like don't make rules that don't exist yeah. because nobody else in the sec is playing by those things don't do it to yourself yeah i call it the notre dame phenomenon um yes. it, no, notre dame would rather limit itself and still be notre dame uh than than win by the rules that you kind of have to play by if you want to be uh in the national championship game uh brent venables it, look this is a program that has a, a very long track record of hiring first year first time head football coaches and and being very successful and the last two guys, uh, frankly. And and so I'm curious, obviously, one of the only preseason top 10 teams to ever finish with the record that it finished with in his first season, but b a big bounce back year in 2023. What What is it that's different about him uh, going into year three? What is it that he's learned? How has he progressed as a head football coach? We know the defensive prowess and, and everything is there. But as a head coach, what is it that he maybe didn't know, but now he has sort of gained ground on? Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. And, and I think anybody, and Braden, I know you've spoken to him before. Anybody that's ever talked to Brent, ever watched Brent in a press conference, it's not going to surprise you to hear that time management can be a problem. Because, and it's not that Brent isn't organized or anything like that. That's that's far from the truth. Brent is a guy that if you stop and talk to him, Brent doesn't know how to say, hi, how are you? I got to go. Like Brent <laughs> is going to engage you and have a real conversation so there's, you know, it's almost Brent Venable standard time uh, when meetings are going to start, those kind of things. <laughs> so I, I think there's been a learning curve with that of, you know, w when he was at Clemson or when he was at Oklahoma or, you know, even dating back to Kansas State with Bill Snyder, who I think we all know would never accept someone being late for a meeting. Brent had somebody that he could answer to and say, uh, you know, I got I got to go. I, I got to be at this meeting. I got to be at our defensive meetings at, you know, two on Wednesday or whatever. But Brent Venables is, he's running all the trains. So, like, he doesn't, if he wants to stay and talk to somebody, that's absolutely what he can do. So, I, I think that's been a learning process. And I think this year, um, when Ted Roof was hired as defensive coordinator, everybody kind of thought, well, that's a figurehead hire. From the way Brent has explained it to local media and even in some national conversations, he kind of took the reins back a little bit this year defensively. And I don't think... I think the defense clearly improved. You could see some signs of that, especially, you know, people will watch this and go back and look at total defense or whatever and say, oh, it doesn't look that great. Go look at the metrics. Like, look at FEI, look at SP+. There's a lot to say that Oklahoma made a real jump defensively. Um, but at the same time, I think Brent at times got divided in his time being basically the defensive coordinator because he was the guy on the field um, really – whether he's the play caller, again, you'll never get anyone to answer that question straight. 
<laughs> but um, Ted Roof's up in the box. So if there's something that's got to be instituted, Brent's the guy, while the offense is on the field, he's over on the bench directing traffic and telling which guys, you know, where they got to be, where the mistakes were, that kind of thing. And we all know Brent's a stickler for detail. So, you know, if a guy was two feet to the left of where he should have been aligned, Brent can't let that slide. That's just not yep. who he is. Yep. Um, so uh, again, I think that has been a big part of it. And now with the, you know, it has not been officially announced our very overwhelming belief that Zach H Alley will be hired as um, Oklahoma's next defensive coordinator. I think that's Brent handing it over to someone he trusts and someone who knows his scheme, knows his defense, knows his vernacular. And at that point he can just go be a head coach. We've heard from behind the scenes. He knows that's something he's got to do. And it's all the more important as a final point. Um, with Matt Wells leaving Oklahoma to go be Kansas State's offensive coordinator, Matt was kind of his right-hand guy, kind of his go-between, even during games, kind of, hey, this yeah. is what we're looking at. This is what we're going to do on this fourth and short at the 45. Like, he was the guy with the book that kind of said, okay, we're going here, we're not going here. So Brent's got to do a lot more of the game management that I think he probably had time to do last year. If I set the over under on playing Oklahoma State at Mike Gundy's retirement, is that about right? Unfortunately, yeah. I mean, because it just, it's one of those things. It's kind of like um, Dabo with the portal. He has said too much. Like, Mike <laughs> is too proud. He can't walk it back. Like, there's, it's, it is Oklahoma's fault. It's all accepted. Like, and it's, you know, the the one that I'll, I'll, and I jab OSU people about it all the time. Well, they've left the conference. That can't happen. I watch South Carolina and Clemson play every year. Somehow they aren't in the same conference. Washington and Washington State are going to continue. Like, you, you just go down the list and you're like, I, I, again, I get the sore feelings. I get why OSU fans are mad. You're hurting your own budget. We, It's well known in Oklahoma that a good portion of OSU's home tickets every time Bedlam's in Stillwater are bought by OU fans, and then they sell it out, you know, to whoever or whatever. So you're just hurting your own bottom line. I, I don't understand. Uh, again, I guess I'm I, I don't have enough stake in the game. Um, well, it might be I, the I just three and fourteen. Why you'd hurt yourself? Is it the yes. three and fourteen record? Maybe that has something to do with it. <laughs> I, I mean, look, look, ego, ego is a big part of this. Texas and Texas A&M yeah. didn't play Pittsburgh and West Virginia, right. like Kansas and Missouri. Like ego is a big part of this. But a lot of times, the state legislative body can get in can get involved, and that's what happened with Washington. That and Washington yeah. State, they're like, and I'm curious, like that's probably the only answer uh, in the short term until some power structure changes at Oklahoma State. But I just wanted to, I just wanted to touch on that, throw some red meat to the wolves. <laughs> um, I, obviously, I want to look at the, this. I'm, I'm not as interested in this particular schedule um, because I'm curious more about what fans are excited about. Certainly, you're rekindling. You get to keep the Texas OU game, of course, which is where I learned how to cuss as a 10 year old. Uh, is it the Cotton Bowl? Uh, I heard words. I looked at my dad and I said, uh, what, what? And and that's literally where I learned how to cuss is the Texas OU game. So we get to keep that, of course. Rekindle the 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 Missouri rivalry, which has been played over 90 plus times for those in the SEC that do not know how many times those have played. You're really catching Ole Miss, Tennessee and Missouri at, at the right time. <laughs> <laughs> if you're an Oklahoma fan, those are probably three of the better teams in the top half of the conference. You got LSU on the schedule, Bam on the schedule, Josh Heupel coming back to town. Uh, and even in the non-conference, Tulane and Houston are no joke. So what what is it that people are excited about, not just in 24 with this particular schedule, but is it just the SEC patch on the shoulder pad? Is it putting yourself up against the best of the game every single year? Like what what is it? The financial stability speaks for itself. So what are the things that people are that that really get them going on the message boards or whatever? Oh yeah, you know you know it's the financial stability <laughs> there, Braden. Uh, they're so excited that an assistant athletic director <laughs> is going to make seventy five k more than he was going to make previously. <laughs> but uh, no, you know I I don't think there's any question that the the Tennessee game again the Josh Heupel thing it that is such a unique relationship in college football because there is such love and adoration for him for being the guy that kind of brought OU back from, you know, the dead that was the nineties and Norman. Um, so there is this special spot that people have in their heart for him, but the way he left and there, this, there's this overwhelming feeling at times that there's a lot of animosity from Josh. I don't know how fair that is. And even if there was, I think it's probably fair to a degree on his part, because like I've mentioned earlier, he kind of got made as the, well, he's the problem. 
there were a lot of other problems within that program that had nothing to do with Josh Heifel. So, uh, and, and Bob made a lot of var- various changes. It wasn't just Josh that, yep. that was, um, was let go. So I think that's a really interesting one. And just an unbelievable, I, I, I cannot believe it's coincidence that the first SEC game is Josh Heupel coming to Norman. Like that, that doesn't, there's no way that just happened. Like, I, I don't believe it. The one, you know, and obviously you, you follow that up and I, I am trying to tell OU fans. Um, I have some family that attended Auburn and I'm like, you guys don't know what Jordan Hare is like. Like you are not ready for that. There's nothing like that in the big 12. Like th- th- there's, there's no place that is that crazy, that loud. And, now, kind of unlike the rest of the schedule, like you mentioned, I mean, you're catching South Carolina pretty fortuitously. You're catching Auburn at probably a pretty good time, although obviously you would expect them to be better in year two uh, under Hugh Freeze. But the rest of that schedule, you're like, guys, seven and five may be good. Like, I'm like, it may not be the worst thing ever if Oklahoma has four or five losses this year because this schedule is just a bear. And the one that I think is kind of sneaky – is I would say is Missouri. Um, obviously, some recruiting battles with with Missouri over recent years. You go back to Luther Burden, who was committed to Oklahoma at one time. Uh, Williams Winery, you know the the number one guy in the country according to some, um, is a was a big time recruit that I thought was headed to Oklahoma until probably the last few weeks of his recruitment. And then obviously the Caden Green situation in the off season that is a very sticky subject <laughs> and uh, a lot, a lot, a lot of people upset about that one. So um, I, I think the fan base is like when that came out with, you would hear it all, you know, when we were all debating who the, how the SEC was going to do this schedule, there was all this talk of, well, you know, you got to restore that old big 12, big eight rivalry. And I'm like, there's no rivalry between Oklahoma and Missouri. And it was like Eli Drinkwitz heard me and was like, oh, we can fix that. Like, you know, they, they just, they, they have created some bad blood uh, awesome. from the Oklahoma side, where I think Oklahoma for a long time just saw Missouri as like, oh, it's your cute little brother. You know, every once in a while they might, they might pop you, but most of the time we'll put them where they belong kind of thing. But Missouri, obviously, huge year, a lot coming back. That's, um, that Good should team. be a fun one. Yeah, it's a good team. Uh, All right. Quickly here, then um, Jackson Arnold with a new play caller and a brand new offensive line. Uh, What are reasonable expect? How how good is he going to be? And what are reasonable expectations? As you just mentioned, this is a team that's probably preseason top 15, but at the same time might be seventh or eighth in the SEC standings when we when we get to media days in Dallas. So what are reasonable expectations for a young guy with a whole lot of talent? Man, just talk about a wild situation. Like I said, I mean, there's Jackson Arnold, maybe the most solid ground Oklahoma has. And it's kind of, if you look at the core of an offense, the offensive line, like you mentioned, Seth Luttrell taking over for Jeff Levy at offensive coordinator. I, Jackson Arnold is probably with the exception of Caleb Williams is the most talented quarterback OU's had on campus in a while. Like, I mean, and probably dating to Kyler Murray. And you talk about guys like Jalen Hurts and all those guys like that. That's that's saying something. It's not a lot of people say, well, I was just five, six years ago. Yeah, but look at all the quarterbacks that have come on OU's campus in that time. Um, he is a guy that has some natural leadership ability, not a big raw, raw guy. This isn't Baker Mayfield uh, that's going to be in your face with that kind of stuff, but definitely has a quality that I think the guys respond to. To me, the whole question for Oklahoma, I, I I don't think Jackson Arnold is a problem at all. I think he's going to – there's going to be growing pains. He's a young quarterback. You understand all that. But I would expect him to be – if everything around him works as it should, I don't see a lot of scenarios where he's not an upper half SEC quarterback next year. Like I, I And it may be – and that may be modest. Like He has the kind of talent to be a, a really front-line guy pretty early on. Um but it's the offensive line. To me, That that's the question. If that can solidify around him, Oklahoma's done some nice work in the portal, getting Spencer Brown from Michigan State, uh, Fabechi Nwewu, whose name I still will never get right, uh, from North Texas, was a freshman All-American under Seth Luttrell, so a guy that Luttrell's really familiar with. If they can put those pieces together, maybe still a Lance Hurd and Terrence Ferguson from LSU and Alabama here late, that would be really big for Oklahoma. Th- those are guys that would solidify that offensive line. Because there are some nice pieces still in Norman, but there wasn't enough there to put together an offensive line that is capable of playing at the level that we expect Oklahoma to play at. 
So I, I think that is, that's really the question, but the expectations for Jackson Arnold to me are if they can keep him clean, there's, there's nothing they shouldn't be able to do. The defense returns a lot. The offense, the skill position should be much better than they were a year ago uh, as they've gotten better. Dion Burks is a guy they're very excited about getting from Purdue. Um, so there is a, there's a lot of optimism with Jackson Arnold. It's just how clean can you keep him? How much is he having to, like we saw with Michael Penix against, you know, Michigan, is he having to look down all the time? Is he having to worry yeah. about that? If he can yeah. just be a quarterback, he's going to be a, a, he'll be a problem for SEC defenses. Uh, all right. I'm, I'm going to let you go. You're very generous with your time, of course. Um, and everybody out there in the SEC world, please go give Josh a follow here. Um, and I think what's interesting is for, for SEC fans that maybe haven't focused as much on Oklahoma or the big 12 over the last 20 years, like this has been the dominant program in this conference for again, basically two decades outside of like Oh five and Oh nine. It, it's largely been the most dominant program, but it does feel like some narratives got flipped here in the last few years with Lincoln Riley leaving and, and Steve Sarkeesian taking over at Texas and sort of how they were entering the SEC. But tell me if this is fair. Like, it feels like they're about 75, 80% of the way to being the program they need to be from a personnel standpoint, an infrastructure standpoint, coaching standpoint, everything, in, in, you know, working together to be a top flight, you know, competing at the top tier in the SEC. Does that, does, is that a fair assessment of the situation? Yeah, I, I would say that's about right because you know I, I mentioned earlier like seven and five is absolutely in the cards for Oklahoma. I mean that that again that schedule is a bear. At the same time, anyone expecting Oklahoma to not match up? The the only question to me is the line of scrimmage play. I mean because everywhere else Oklahoma's got personnel and athletes that can play with anybody in the country. Um, you know you, you can go back to that Georgia game in in twenty seventeen where. Oklahoma was far more lackluster defensively than they are now, yeah. but they were just so talented outside they could kind of make up for it. Now, there's no Hollywood Brown right now. There's no C.D. Lamb. I'm not trying to make direct comparisons. I'm just saying there's plenty of talent if Oklahoma's playing a seven-on-seven -seven game. They, they could play with anybody in the country. It's just going to be how they can develop. I like where the defensive line is going, getting guys like Jacob Lacey to come back. Uh, DeJon Terry was a really good player, a uh, guy they took from Tennessee uh, out of the portal last year. Really good to get him back for OU. But to me, uh, again, I, I think you're talking about a class or two away, some more good portal ads. And, I mean, Oklahoma is a school that expects to play with everybody. Like, that. that's not – you know, I know a lot of people say, oh, they've been in the Big 12. Guy, uh, you know, you can go look through the history. Oklahoma's beaten Alabama plenty of times when they faced them. I think won two of their last three meetings, something like that. Now that dates back a ways. I'm not. I'm right. not saying that right. Oklahoma is ready to be on Alabama's level. I'm just saying this is a program that has that level of expectation. And if Brent Venables doesn't get them there in fairly short order, they will go find someone that they think yep. can. I mean, that that's just the nature of this beast. And I think that's again what Oklahoma has to accept about being in the SEC. There's no time to waste. Like yep. it, it, if you're yep. not doing, if you're not moving in the right direction, find someone who will get you there. Yep. Just a little bit more front front seven recruiting, a little bit more talent, a little bit more NIL, a little bit more infrastructure, a year to adapt. And I think you're up and running. Cause again, for those that don't know, this was the Alabama in the big 12 for like 19 straight seasons, basically 20, 20 years. So <laughs> Josh, always a pleasure, my man. Thank you so much for coming on. Always good to see you. Always good to talk to you and high, high praise for Jackson Arnold. So looking forward to watching him play uh, in the sec and a 12 team playoff, not out of the reach for Oklahoma very quickly. Once they get to the conference, Josh, thank you so much, man. Appreciate your time, dude. Anytime, Braden.